For six weeks last summer, Dr. Kent Brantley worked nonstop treating dozens of Ebola patients at a hospital in Liberia. Ebola is highly contagious and deadly, claiming up to 90% of its victims. Despite taking extreme precautions, Brantley started feeling sick and three days later heard the devastating news that he too had contracted the deadly virus. Christians around the world began praying for Brantley's recovery. His mission organization, SIM, arranged to have him evacuated to Emory Hospital in Atlanta, making Kent Brantley the first person infected with Ebola to be brought to the United States for treatment. Miraculously, he survived and was released from isolation three weeks later. He and his wife, Amber, have written about their experience in a new book, Called for Life, How Loving Our Neighbor Led Us Into the Heart of the Ebola Epidemic. Well, Dr. Kent Brantley and his wife, Amber, are joining us now. And Kent, you know, I, I was just fascinated by this book. At what point did you think you were dying? Did you ever give up and you said, I'm going to die, I'm ready to meet the Lord? There was a night, Thursday, July 31st, okay. when I looked at the nurse standing next to my bed and I said, I don't know how you're going to breathe for me when I quit breathing because I really thought that I might die that night of respiratory failure. I was having such a hard time breathing. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever gave up, but I had a tremendous peace from mm -hmm. the Lord that in spite of the anxiety that I was feeling, the fear that I was facing, I just wanted to be faithful. Mm -hmm. I desperately wanted to be well, faithful. You know, you had diarrhea 10, 12, 15 times a day. You're a doctor and you knew that bloody flux coming out of you. You knew what it meant. and it, it meant your organs were collapsing, didn't it? It did. And, and it, was, it was even more than that. More than that? They said in my first day at Emory, they said in the first 24 hours, I think I went through 28 bedpans. 20? Well, how did you survive? I, I, you'd be so weak. I don't understand how you were even able to hold your head up. A lot of good supportive care from the people taking care of me in Liberia and at Emory. Well, over in Liberia, apparently there was this guy uh, who had had the stuff and uh, he had developed an immunity. And so you had live transfusions from this African? That's right. Our first survivor, the only survivor that I treated mm -hmm. in our seven, first two months of the outbreak, was a 14-year-old boy who kept in touch with me after he recovered. He would call me about once or twice a week and just check on me and let me know how his family mm -hmm. was doing. And after I got sick with Ebola, he called me one day and I told him, I'm, I'm sick with that Ebola virus. And then I discussed with his guardian the idea of a blood transfusion. My doctors were interested in that possibility. And that, that young boy and his family wanted to do anything they could to help, and he came to the hospital and donated a unit of blood for me. Well, it was amazing. You, you write in here about this uh, outfit in Kentucky that has developed uh, uh, anti-clonal, uh, monoclonal antibody uh, treatment uh, based on tobacco. <laughs> we found a good use for tobacco, finally. It is a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal medication, a phenomenal process to produce this medication. Um, my story with, with ZMAP is, is one anecdote. And while I think it's a very convincing anecdote, scientifically speaking, it takes much more data than one patient to sure. prove whether something works or not. So that drug's actually in trial right now in West Africa. Well, if they hadn't had it, you may have died. We don't know. <laughs> All right. Amber, you have your husband, you love him you're together, and you're serving the Lord in Liberia, and all of a sudden, did you think he was going to die? I um, always clung to hope that he wouldn't, but I, I didn't eliminate it as a possibility. There were some moments, like the Thursday that he mentioned, mm -hmm. that I, I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure. When you were praying, I mean, could you get hold of the Lord, or did you just feel hopeless? I swayed in and out of that. I yeah. had so much support from our family and dear friends who um, surrounded me and cared for me and my children and prayed for me and sent me messages and sent me scripture that I could pray because I couldn't even think enough to come up with that on my own. But I, I prayed the hymns that I grew up with and I prayed the Psalms and I was just sustained by, by our support there. 
there were millions of people praying for it. This thing was a worldwide phenomenon because you were, I mean, the whole thing. But they put you in quarantine, too. In a way. In a way. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of hid out away from the media, but I wasn't forced to quarantine oh, myself you medically. Forced, so I, I, thought... was, I had to um, measure my temperature mm -hmm. several times a day. But I wasn't forced to quarantine, but it, uh, it did protect me from the media and the chaos that was happening around well, us. Well, Kent, you know, it was so primitive what you're saying. You know, I've worked in the library extensively, and uh, it, it was worse than what you said. I mean, I didn't know it was as bad as what you said. You didn't have anything but Tylenol. I mean, I can't believe it. How, how did you survive this thing? I thank God that I'm here today. Yes. He used a lot of incredible people to take care of me from the moment I felt sick mm -hmm. until my recovery. Well, well, you had to get out of Liberia. You probably would have died under that primitive condition. And what did you have to do in order to enable yourself? You had to uh, have somebody get you an airplane. I think Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Samar Purse. Samaritan's Purse did everything within their abilities to, to take care of me. And they had contacts in the State Department and with Phoenix Air and the Liberian government and all of these different players came together. It took so many different people mm -hmm. to make that evacuation happen. And they were able to fly airplane to Liberia, put me on it and return well, to Atlanta. They didn't tell anybody you were coming. Nobody wants Ebola in their city. I mean, the, the people of Atlanta didn't exactly send out a brass band to welcome you. I was, inc I'm incredibly thankful to the CDC and the people at Emory University Hospital who put themselves out there and said, we're willing to take care of the first Ebola patient in America. What was the plane like? You were in a G3 and you were flying across the ocean. How, how was it fig configured, that plane you were in? I was in a, a reclining bed, like a hospital cot, uh -huh. um, inside this plastic pod, that uh, aeromedical biocontainment system. And I had a bucket for a toilet Mm -hmm. And I had bottles of water and hand sanitizer and a, a small handheld radio, like a walkie-talkie, to be able to talk to the medical crew. And they would come in periodically and check on me in their full protective equipment. It was a very long ride. It must have been horrible. Well, you, you were in a pod, though. Well, when you got off, you, 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 did they have you in some sort of a pod to get you off the plane? I, I, they put one of those protective suits on me, and I walked off of the plane with the help of a paramedic and they put me in the ambulance, and that was the same paramedic who helped me walk into the hospital. I don't see how you walked. How by did the, you By walk? the grace of God. <laughs> really? After, I mean, after that Z map, I had a, about a 48 or 60 hour window of improved strength. Oh. And it was during that window of time that the evacuation occurred. And it was, it was, it was an answer to prayer. It was maybe the effect of the medication, rehydration, and, hmm. and the grace of God. Uh, Dr. Robertson, yeah. I, I wanna be sure that one thing we talk about yeah. today is that this outbreak is not over. Yeah. That people in West Africa are still suffering from Ebola. Just last week, there were 26 new cases diagnosed in Sierra Leone and Guinea. And Liberia, which was declared Ebola free in May, mm -hmm. had a resurgence of cases at the end of June. They don't know anything about uh, sanitation. Is, is that it? Or, or? There are a lot of factors that are propagating this outbreak. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's getting better. But one of the problems they've had is that these new cases that are popping up, they don't, they don't even know where they're getting it from. They're not the contacts that have been traced. That's, that's improving. And yeah. in Sierra Leone, that was really improved. Or in Conakry, that was really improved this last week. But there's well, a lot of work, and we need to be praying for our, our neighbors in West ago, Africa. I, I was working with that organization in uh, uh, Zaire. And of course, Ebola, as you know, was named after the Ebola River in Zaire. And they had a big outbreak in Kikwik. And we were sending supplies. And, uh, but they, they didn't know. But it was coming, as I understand, out of bats. Uh, and, uh, you know, in KK, and they still don't know, but what does it take, one drop of blood? I mean, what, to, to spread that stuff? It's very contagious, isn't it? It, it just takes a little bit of contact with a person who's sick with it. Well, how'd you get it? I mean, you had some little girl you wanted to be nice to? I, I think I probably, I will never know for sure. Uh -huh. I'll never know for sure. I think I probably contracted it from one of the patients I was taking care of in the emergency room. 
outside of the Ebola treatment unit or maybe from her family member who is helping tend to her as I tried to counsel that family member and gain mm. her trust that we were trying to do the best thing for her mother. And it was probably somewhere in that interaction. Well, did you wear the hazmat suit all the time? Or you, you had the, that uh, protective gear off when you were dealing with her? I, had, I was not wearing that gear in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. It was not practical or feasible or good or safe to do that. In the, mm -hmm. in, you couldn't do it all the time. In the, it, in the treatment unit, we wore that protective gear. Our protocols, our procedures, our equipment were all safe and appropriate. But in the emergency department, where you have the undifferentiated patient coming in. You don't know, do they have malaria or, or is this Ebola? Well, I was over there. They had uh, something they used to call uh, diarrhea rouge, which was really more deadly almost than the Ebola. I mean, they just uh, just had constant diarrhea. Was that one of the symptoms you had? That's a really important point is that this Ebola outbreak has been terrible. And there have been over 11,284 people who have yeah. died in this outbreak. But there are a lot of problems in, in West Africa and in, in the African continent that are a lot of health problems that kill more people every year than Ebola mm -hmm. that, that we need to be paying attention to. We need to be showing love and compassion to our neighbors in West Africa, not only for Ebola, but for all of the other factors, uh, other problems. Malaria kills hundreds of thousands oh, yeah. of people every year. And, and we need to be doing something about it. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of DDT. When they banned DDT, malaria jumped to, you know, what is it, five or 600 million? I mean, it's horrible in the number of people. Let me ask you, is there a chance that this Ebola would break out you know, on an airplane or something, come to the United States and really start a major epidemic? Or has that been? Uh, I think what we saw at the peak of this epidemic with the cases that were diagnosed in this country is that our healthcare system is equipped in a totally different way than the health systems in West Africa for dealing with a problem like Ebola. And even though we had some cases diagnosed here, we were able to prevent a, a large outbreak. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we need to set that fear of, of the zombie apocalypse in America <laughs> aside, and we need to be worried about putting an end to this outbreak in West you Africa. You wanna go back to Liberia, Amber? I'd love to Would someday. You really? I, we, we got to go back in June this summer yeah. for a visit, and it was so brief, but um, so necessary for our family to get to go back and see our friends and greet and thank all the people who took care of Kent. And well, nice. um, it was a wonderful visit, and we, our hearts are there, and we'll, we'll always be forever changed by our time yeah. in Liberia. Well, I tell you, it's an amazing story. Ladies and gentlemen, this book is called uh, Call for Life. You want to read it. It's, it's, it's very well done. And it's Amber talking and Kent talking and Amber talking and Kent talking. So you go back and forth to their point of view. But uh, thank God for you and your testimony and thank you. your service. Uh, ELWA used to be a, a, a Christian radio station. You were working with them or, or, or who yes. you? Yeah. In fact, when we went back in June, I got to be interviewed on that radio station. It's still there. It's still there. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that's all right. Well, God bless you both. And ladies and gentlemen, it's called Call for Life, a survivor of the dread Ebola outbreak in uh, uh, West Africa. Mm -hmm.